In this video, I'm going to get you guys up and running with the Creality Falcon 2. Now, this is Creality's first serious attempt at competing in the open frame desktop laser cutter and engraver space. They did have some previous models, but the Falcon 2 is definitely the best equipped with a 22 watt laser module, fire detection, air assist, and more. Throughout the video, I'll introduce you guys to some upgrades and accessories that I've designed for this machine. And at the end, I'll give you guys my thoughts and opinions on it. I've put a lot of effort into this video, trying to be as thorough as possible to bring you guys as much value as possible for watching my content. I just wanna send a big thank you out to Creality for sending me this piece of equipment. That's the only compensation that I received for making this video. And if you guys are in the market for one, there'll be a link in the video description down below. So go check that out. And if you guys are looking to support me and my work, check out my website, embracemaking.com. Let's get started. We'll start here with the unboxing and as you would expect, the Creality Falcon is nicely and safely packaged with the accessories being nested in the center of the machine frame. I was very pleased to see at the bottom of the box, there was an aluminum honeycomb laser bed as a lot of other brands don't include this. Taking a closer look at the accessories included in this kit, we get a nice material sample pack and in those plastic bags, you'll find the USB cable, the laser focus guide and a cleaning brush. We get laser safety goggles. Of course, we have the laser module itself. This is the 22 watt model. There is a power supply, the air assist pump. There is a toolbox and some spare parts, and then the rotary tool here. And lastly, you'll find the four feet that the machine frame will rest upon. I was also sent this laser engraver enclosure, which is not included standard with the Falcon 2, but we'll get to that a little later. Now we're on to the machine assembly and not to worry if you're not a very technical person, this was still very easy to put together. The machine comes mostly pre-assembled, which is fantastic. And one of the very few things you need to install onto the machine are the feet. If you look at the bottom of the frame, you'll notice that there are three different holes at each of the four corners of the frame. The purpose of the additional holes is to be able to fit the frame onto a smaller table. Of course, the rest of the frame will overhang that table, but it just gives you that option. In my case, I have a large enough table, so I'm gonna be using the last four holes. And as you can see, the feet just screw into the holes at the bottom of the frame. Up at the top, you have the laser head carriage, which rides on the X-axis gantry, and I've loosened the thumb screws so that we can take the laser head module. Again, this is the 22 watt. And if you look at the back, there's a dovetail-like joint with the complementary feature on the carriage, so the laser head module can slide up and down. And if you tighten those thumb screws, it locks the head into place. Attached to the laser module, you'll find a wire lead and connector. And that connector is going to plug into the distribution block on the left hand side of the gantry. The wire will get pushed into the wire management clips. And again, I'm going to plug that connector in on the left hand side. At this point, we can also take the soft air assist tubing and push it onto the barbed connector that's recessed inside of the laser module. Creality also gives you these soft Velcro cable ties. So I'm gonna make use of two of these and tie together the air assist tubing and that wire lead. Push the laser head side to side and make sure that the wires don't get caught on anything. Now, although the machine comes pre-assembled, there are a few other things that we should check. For instance, I noticed that my X-axis carriage seemed a little bit loose. If you remove the laser module, you'll find an eccentric nut that you can make a small adjustment to with the included wrench, and that's gonna take up the play in the V-wheel that the carriage rides on. Interestingly, I had a similar problem with the entire gantry. It wobbled quite a bit. And so if you flip the machine on its side, you'll find one eccentric nut on one side of the gantry, and on the other side, you'll find the second eccentric nut tucked in behind the stepper motor. I made a small adjustment to both sides to take up that additional plate in the gantry, but whatever you do, do not over tighten these wheels. You'll know if you over tighten these if you go to move the gantry or the carriage by hand, and it almost feels like there are flat spots on the wheels, then you know they're too tight. This is also a good time to check your belt tension. The Y axis has two belts, one on either side of the frame. If you look at the two back corners of the frame, on the side you'll notice these button head screws that lock the tensioner pulleys into place. And on the very back of the frame, that middle screw there is the one that corresponds with the tensioner pulley itself. Therefore, if you had to tighten the belt, you would loosen off the button head screw on the side, you would tighten the screw at the back and that would pull on this pulley, which would tighten your belt, and then you would lock the button head screw back down. There's a similar system for the belt on the X gantry. So at the top, you'll see the button head screw, which again locks that pulley into place. 
And if we look at the bottom of the gantry, you'll see the pulley and you'll see a hex head bolt, which again, you would just tighten with the included 10 millimeter wrench. That's gonna pull that pulley in and provide tension on the belt. And then again, you would tighten up the button head cap screw on the top side to lock it in place. With the mechanical stuff out of the way, we can now make some of the electrical connections. So we have the power supply cable, which is keyed. So be sure you plug it in the correct way. And you have the USB cable on that side of the machine. And then on the left side of the machine, you have the power and control cable for the air assist. And then you can remove the dust cap off the air assist outlet and install the air assist tube. There's an air assist flow dial on this side of the machine. We're gonna increase that all the way to the maximum and I'll show you guys how to control the air assist strength later on in the software. Before we start lasering, there's a few other things that we should set up and the first one is the firmware. I've gone to the Creality Downloads section of their website and downloaded the latest firmware for the Falcon 2. Inside of the zip folder, there's a couple files. One of them will be the firmware for the master controller and the other will be the firmware for the laser head. I'm going to format the micro SD card that came with this kit. And if you're using your own SD card, be sure not to use something larger than eight gigabytes. It's pretty common that some of these controllers do not like flashing firmware from SD cards larger than eight gigabytes. Copy over the master bin file onto that SD card. It should be the only thing on that card. Turn the machine on and I've sped this clip up, but you'll see a sequence of white flashing lights. And when the lights turn green, you're done. Now we can bring the SD card back to our computer, format it again, and copy over the .bin file for the laser module head. And you'll see that this one says 22 watts in the file name. The laser module does not have a micro SD card slot, but under this dust cap, it does have a USB-C connector. Use the included adapters to get the SD card plugged into the USB-C slot. Then we can go back to the front of the machine, power it on, and again, I sped this clip up, but you'll get a little bit of a light show from those lights and eventually they'll turn green and you'll likely hear the air assist turn on. Now the mainboard and laser module have the latest firmware. Now I consider my workspace part of my setup and during the assembly, I was working on top of this vinyl cutting mat. These cutting mats are not laser safe. These cutting mats are commonly made from PVC and vaporizing PVC with a laser is extremely dangerous. It can give off toxic fumes that can hurt you and other people inside of your house. So rather than use one of those, what I put underneath of my laser machines are these silicone mats. They're highly heat resistant and in a previous video, I performed a through cut directly on top of the mat and it did not melt through. These mats come in various sizes and I'll put a link to them in the video description down below. Now I would not recommend cutting directly on top of that mat. Again, that was just to prove their durability. So I have the mat there and that's to protect the table if I make any mistakes. Between the mat and the honeycomb is this aluminum plate that was included with the kit. You noticed that during the unboxing. And at the very top, we have our honeycomb laser bed. And now I'm gonna show you guys how to focus your laser module. The Falcon 2 comes with this stepped focusing tool. And if we were to pretend here that I wanted to engrave the top of this metal sheet, I would lower my laser module onto the top step, the highest step, which says right on it, engraving. And with the frame of the laser module resting on top of the step, we can tighten the thumb screws down. Now our laser would be correctly focused to engrave the top surface of the sheet. But sadly, this blue laser cannot mark this bare aluminum, so we have to go find something that it will engrave. Now luckily we do have a lot of options. Included on the SD card with the Falcon 2, you'll find a parameter sheet, where you'll find different speeds and power settings for engraving and cutting various materials. Obviously this is not a complete list, but it will give you a very good starting point of where to work with certain materials. And in our case, we're gonna be starting with brushed stainless steel. The included material sample kit came with a two millimeter thick stainless steel plate. And in a lot of the advertising that I've seen for the Falcon 2, I've seen all sorts of claims that it can engrave in various colors on stainless steel. So that's what we're gonna try. If you read the notes on the side here, it does mention the colors with stainless steel and it brings particular attention to the focal length, power, and of course, speed settings to produce those different colors. Now, if you've done any engraving or cutting on wood, you've probably come across one of these laser power and speed test cards. These can be fairly easily generated in a software called Lightburn, but in Laser GRBL, which we'll be using for this video, it's a little more difficult. However, I did find an open source project on GitHub by a guy named Laser Sal, who put together this HTML page 
which will produce a laser test card and you can input the different settings and it'll output the appropriate g-code and if you just click the image it'll actually download the .nc file which we can import into laser grpl so big shout out to laser cell i'll put a link to that in the video description down below now there's a few reasons I'm using laser GRBL for this video and the first one is that it's free. Another reason is that this video is geared more towards beginners and so if you are a Lightburn user, chances are you're already more of an advanced user and anything that I do in laser GRBL, you'll likely be able to pretty easily replicate in Lightburn. And so for you beginners out there, all I've done at this point is connected the included USB-C cable from the Falcon 2 to my laptop. Up at the top, you see I have the COM7 port selected, and for you guys, it might be something different depending on what your computer assigns to that USB port. You can see the baud rate, and I've clicked the connect button. Now we're connected to the machine, and we can read in the machine settings. And this is useful because we can see the machine limitations. So things like the speeds in the X and Y axis might be different, and you can see that on this machine, they in fact are. And this is going to help us prevent trying to exceed those limitations when we go to cut or engrave something. Also later in the video, I'll show you how we can edit some of these settings. And this is also a good way to just double check that we didn't edit something and put in an incorrect value. But for now, I haven't edited anything and everything looks okay. So we're just going to go to file, open file, and I'm going to select one of these NC files that the laser card test generator had generated. As you can see, there's a huge matrix of speed and power settings. On the Y axis, you have the speed settings in millimeters per minute. And on the X axis, you have the power settings where 100 is 10% and 1000 is 100%. With my laser safety glasses on and the laser head lined up with the bottom left hand corner of my material, I can hit the green play button and the job will start. By varying the speed and the intensity of the laser, the concept here is to subject the surface of this stainless steel to various temperature. And from my research online, what I could find is that the colors are related to the oxidation resistance of the steel. It says that the heat tint or temper color formed is caused by the progressive thickening of the surface oxide layer. And so as temperature is increased, the colors change. But as I quickly learned, it's not just any temperature or speed settings that work, you have to definitely be in the correct range. And as you can see from my first test, I started with a range of speeds that were just way too slow. And if I had a better camera or even a microscope, you'd see that some of these darker areas probably look like little welds. So my first test ended up being more or less just a bunch of black squares. I won't bore you with all of the trial and error that went into this, but essentially what I did was I started looking for the lighter areas. So in this case, in the upper left corner of this matrix, and then I tried to zoom in on those settings and tried to produce more test cards with a finer resolution in those areas where I was starting to see some color. My goal was to eventually work my way into a range of settings where the entire test card looked like a rainbow. I watched a lot of other YouTubers try and demonstrate the ability for the Falcon 2 to produce colors, but one thing I noticed that they were doing was just setting a very large range of speeds and powers, and they never really dialed in and found a very tight and narrow band producing a nice palette of colors. I wasn't really satisfied with the amount of information that was out there on YouTube already, so I really tried to dial in these settings so you guys have an even better starting point and you don't have to go through this entire process like I did. Eventually my efforts started to bear some decent results and what I could see from the colors and how they related to the speed and intensity of the laser, it did line up with the information I found online. So colors such as pale yellow, online it says that the approximate surface temperature would have been heated to about 290 degrees celsius whereas a dark blue would have been even hotter at 600 degrees celsius browns reds and purples were somewhere in between that range eventually it brought me to this range of settings that you can see right here and in a moment you'll see the result on the actual stainless steel test piece this produced a nice palette of colors for me However, if you use these settings, I would venture a guess that you might end up with some different results. And this goes back to what was mentioned on that parameter sheet from Creality. The colors that are produced on the surface of the stainless steel are going to be very sensitive to 
minor changes in focal length as well as thickness of the material because again you have to remember that these colors are being produced by temperature. On the surface of this test piece there are two test matrices and these matrices have some overlapping power and speed settings. But if you were to look closely, those same settings produced different colors. Now the reason for that, I think, is because this piece here is a little warped, and that's going to result in a different focal length, even though some of those squares had the exact same speed and intensity settings. Therefore, I'd suggest using my settings as a starting point, and just keep in mind that if you're using a thicker piece of stainless steel, it's going to act like a big heatsink, and you might have to venture into a higher range of laser intensities to get the same colors. Conversely, you'll likely do the opposite with a thinner piece of stainless steel, and if you're ever hoping to achieve consistency with the coloring of stainless steel, then I think you're going to have to be very careful when it comes to your machine setup and the materials that you're using. You'll have to be very precise with your focal length, as well as the flatness of your material will have to be very good, and I'd be willing to bet that even the chemistry of the stainless steel will have to be consistent as different grades of stainless steel will likely color differently. Next, I'm going to demonstrate lasering some patterns and logos onto these aluminum wallets. Now, these wallets, I believe they are anodized aluminum and not just painted, and that's based on how scratch resistant they seem to be. Since these are no longer test pieces and I actually want to use these wallets, I want the logos and patterns to appear in the center of the wallet. To make that happen, I need to square up my workpiece with the frame. I drop the height of the laser module down so that I could make contact with the wallet and the side of the laser module on two sides of the wallet so that it's nice and square to the frame. Once I'm happy with the alignment of the workpiece, I can raise the laser module back up. I can put my focusing guide down on top of my workpiece and then I can set the laser focus to engraving. If you guys are looking for these blank wallets, I'll put a link to them in the video description down below and also keep watching because I have an alternative solution to squaring up your work pieces. We'll get to that in a little bit. In Laser GRBL, I'm going to open my design as a PNG file and I've generated this file in Adobe Illustrator. I'm going to leave this on vectorize instead of line to line tracing and I just find that on these wallets or even water bottles, having the laser outline the filled areas tends to produce a sharper outline in my opinion than not having an outline at all. And since this 22 watt laser module has a 0.1 millimeter laser spot, I'm going to set the filling quality to 10 lines per millimeter. And the logic behind that is just simply 1 millimeter divided by 0.1 is 10. Now the border speed and filling speed on these anodized aluminum wallets, I'm going to set to 800 millimeters per minute and the maximum laser intensity to 80%. I'm going to double check here that the size of my image makes sense and that it's not offset in the X and Y. I'm going to click create and then we have our design ready to go. And with the Falcon 2 connected, I can use the buttons at the bottom of laser GRBL, such as this center button or even the framing or blink button to get a sense of where I need to position my laser module and in this case my origin for this picture is at the bottom left corner of my image so that's where I want to start with my laser module. I need it at the bottom left corner of my wallet. If you're unfamiliar with how this works when you first turn your machine on and you connect with laser GRBL both the software and the machine just assume that the position of the laser head is already at zero zero the origin. If you don't hit the home button, it's just going to think that wherever that laser head currently rests is where that program is going to start. This is known as relative positioning. And so for example, in this case, my wallet is 100 millimeters tall by 65 millimeters wide. And if I were to press that center button, then the laser module itself will move 50 millimeters in the Y direction positive, as well as 32.5 millimeters in the X direction positive and it'll place itself where it thinks it's the center of the wallet. Had I originally positioned the laser module in the top right hand corner of the wallet, if I had pressed that center button, well then the machine would just take the laser module and put it somewhere off of the surface of the wallet. And therefore if I had run the job, I would be missing the wallet altogether. If instead I wanted to use absolute positioning, then I'd hit the home button in the bottom left hand corner of the screen and the Falcon 2 would take the laser module and home it in the X and Y axes using the limit switches. The laser head would be parked in the bottom left hand corner of the frame 
and I'd have to take my wallet and bring it down to the bottom left hand corner of the frame and align it with the X and Y axes down there. And so you can see by not using absolute positioning and instead just relying on relative positioning, I was able to put my workpiece, which is this wallet, right in the middle of the frame where it is much easier to see and access. While this job's running, I wanna point out one other detail related to laser safety so that you guys don't make the same mistakes that I did. I made my design a little bit larger than the wallet itself because I had the idea here of having the laser go over those rounded edges of the wallet. Unfortunately, I also made my design overshoot the top and bottom edges, and if you take a look at the bottom edge of that wallet, there's a plastic lever. I mentioned earlier in the video, you definitely don't want a laser PVC. Another type of plastic you want to avoid lasering is ABS, and that's likely what that lever is made out of. This produced a really bad odor, and I had to clear the room out immediately and try and ventilate the room as quickly as possible. And so the takeaway here is to try and avoid any bits of plastic on things like wallets or other gadgets that you might be engraving. Despite that mishap, the rest of the wallet came out looking fantastic. I did manage to get the pattern around the round edges, and the sharpness and quality of the image was excellent. Therefore, if you're doing something like these wallets, I would recommend those settings that I used, and again, that was 800 millimeters per minute for the speed and 80% intensity for the power. I'm about to tackle another wallet and I want to show you guys another technique that I use to line up the laser head with the workpiece. Sometimes it can be hard to eyeball where the laser beam is, especially if you're using the blink function and you're shooting it down into the empty honeycomb. So by placing something like a business card here, when you press the blink button, you can actually see where the laser beam's hitting in relation to your workpiece. And then of course you can line it up with the bottom left hand corner of your workpiece. If you guys aren't familiar with the blink button, it's down here at the bottom of laser GRBL. And now that I can see where my laser was aligned, I can press the framing button. And that's going to draw an outline around the graphic that I'm about to engrave on this second wallet. This will help us make sure that our image is centered on the wallet and it will help us judge whether or not the wallet is squared up with the frame and the alignment is good. In this case, I feel like I've gotten everything right on the first try, so I'll hit the play button in laser GRBL and start the job. This time around, I designed a smaller graphic to be sure that the laser would stay within the bounds of the metal portion of the wallet and not hit that plastic and produce those dangerous fumes. You'll also notice that the wallet is black, but I used the exact same settings as the previous silver wallet, and the result was also amazing. One thing I did notice was that this image was a little more beige in color than it was on the silver wallet, and perhaps that's because the black surface absorbed this blue laser a little more than the gray one. It still looked really nice, but if I were to do this again, maybe I'd try a slightly higher speed at the same power. We'll come back to lasering more materials in a minute, and I want to take a quick break to show you guys a fume extractor upgrade that I designed for the 22 watt laser module. I've designed fume extractors for other laser engravers in the past, and they've been very effective at sucking up smoke and fumes at the source. I'll be making this version for the 22 watt Falcon available on my website, so let's take a look at how to assemble and install this thing. There are three pieces to this kit, and the top piece is the Y adapter, and these two pieces I'm holding right now are the two nozzles, a left hand and a right hand side. The nozzles will mount to the Y adapter with some M3 thread forming screws. Now the mounting holes have been designed in such a way that you can't put the left hand side on the right side and vice versa. There's only one way to mount these things and those mounting holes will only line up in the correct orientation. So once we have those holes lined up, we can just simply screw in the M3 thread forming screws. And as the name would suggest, these screws will cut their own threads into the plastic and secure the nozzles. There will be four of these screws in total, two for each side. And when you're done, your assembly should look something like this. Now we can grab our laser module and take a look at the top. You'll find four of these flathead screws, which we're going to remove. While removing these screws, keep your finger on that top plate so it doesn't fall off. Then we can bring over our fume extractor assembly and we can put it directly on top of the laser module. You'll notice from the top view that this piece here is not symmetrical. So there is a front side and a back side, but again, this is pretty hard to mess up because it's only gonna fit on one way. And once you have it aligned correctly like I do here, you can grab the M3 socket head cap screws included with the kit, and that's gonna fasten this entire assembly down onto the top of the laser module. You don't have to go too crazy here and over tighten those screws as it's just holding the nozzle and the original cover in place. 
And that's all there is to it. Now we're ready to mount this thing back on the machine. With the assembly back on the machine, you're probably wondering what do we use to provide suction to suck up those fumes. A while back, I made a video showing how I adapted HEPA and carbon filters to common shop vacs. The extraction nozzle connects to the shop vac filtration system using a common CPAP hose. I selected these hoses because they're extremely lightweight and flexible so they won't interfere with the motion of your laser engraver. I'll put a link to the shop vac filtration system video in the top right hand corner of the screen and if you're interested in these shop vac filter adapters I have quite a few models available on my website embracemaking.com including one for this very inexpensive 5 gallon bucket head vacuum. I particularly like this one because it's so cheap and it fits on a common 5 gallon pail. Even the pre-filter that comes with this vacuum conveniently fits over the HEPA filter that I had selected. Now let's have a look at this thing in action, engraving some wood which would typically produce quite a bit of smoke. We'll start by importing a grayscale raster image test into laser GRPL. For this test we're going to select line to line tracing and then you'll see more of the details of this image come up. And then by playing with the white clip slider, we can ensure that none of the gradient is lost in this image. And so what you'll notice is that as I slide the slider to the right, we'll start losing some of the lighter shades of gray. In this case, it looks like we're gonna have the slider all the way to the left-hand side, so nothing is clipped. And you can see the preview, everything looks great. I'm gonna hit the next button, and we're gonna set the engraving speed to 15,000 millimeters per minute because it's going to be scanning from left to right in the x-axis. The x-axis has a theoretical speed limit of 25,000 millimeters per minute. I've set the laser intensity to a maximum of 75% and I set the laser mode to M4, which will allow the power to be modulated from that zero to 75% to produce a grayscale image. Earlier in the video, I'd mentioned I was gonna show you guys how to control the air assist through the software. So in the G-code terminal window, I just typed in dollar sign 150 equals two. Essentially, I've assigned a value of two to dollar sign 150, which is the air assist strength. And now you'll see if I go in and read the configuration, you'll see a value of two beside dollar sign 150. A value of four would be the maximum value on the Creality Falcon, and I think that would be more appropriate for cutting. So we'll set it to two for engraving. Now before we start engraving, I want to show you guys one more tool here that I came up with that should help make squaring up our material a little bit easier. I've got this piece here and it's got the same three steps on it that are found on the focusing tool that comes with the Falcon 2. And on the back side it has this recessed pocket which will allow us to take our workpiece, assuming that it has a square corner, and slide it into that pocket. The corner of the workpiece will line up perfectly with the hole in the center of this tool. Then we can place these two pieces back down on our honeycomb bed and you'll see the lines marked out on this tool line up with the edges of our workpiece. Then we can take our laser module and use the steps on this tool to set the focus. After the focus has been set, we can take the entire laser module and now slide it over into the bottom left hand corner of the tool. With the laser head pushed all the way down into the bottom corner, the laser is now lined up perfectly with the corner of your material and your material is perfectly square with the frame. If you guys are interested in this tool, check the video description down below or my website embracemaking.com. I'm going to run this test on this sample piece of basswood and you can see that right now I do have that fume extractor nozzle installed. I have the vacuum system on and as you can see there's no buildup of smoke in the area of engraving or around the laser engraver at all. Engraving won't produce nearly as much smoke as cutting but considering I don't have an enclosure around this machine right now and there's no smoke escaping into the open air and filling my room, I'd say that this is working very effectively. You'll also notice that I've already run this test several times now, and in all cases I had the speed set to 15,000 millimeters per minute, but I varied the maximum laser intensity. The maximum laser intensity of 75% that I presented to you a moment ago was the best result that I could achieve. The main criteria that I was using to judge the settings was how much of that grayscale image can I actually see and how much is lost. In one of the previous tests, I set the maximum power to 90%, and you can see that a lot of the detail in the higher percentages was lost. At a maximum intensity of 75%, it's a little easier to discern between the incremental steps of 5%. However, I was disappointed that the border around each of those fill areas was mostly lost. In all of the tests, the border on the far left side was very blurry, and I don't think it was a focal length issue because this piece of wood is fairly flat. It's almost as if the power couldn't be modulated quickly enough to produce a lighter border directly adjacent to those darker fill areas. 
I'll have to do a little more testing to figure out what's going on here. If you guys have any thoughts, please put them in the comment section down below. The vertical gradient bar beside it with the very fine text did turn out quite nice. The only other thing that I can think of is that this piece of sample wood is pretty low quality and perhaps the different areas of the wood grain is absorbing the laser differently. Now we can have a look at marking some glass. And so what I have here is the sample piece of glass that comes with the Falcon 2. And I've spray painted the backside with some flat black spray paint, nothing special. And I've put it inside of this square holder that I 3D printed. I've gone ahead and opened my graphic in Laser GRBL and I've chosen to vectorize this image because I'm hoping similar to the wallets that outlining the text and the graphic will produce a sharper image. For this image, I'm gonna set the border speed to 6,000 millimeters per minute, the filling speed to 6,500 millimeters per minute, and the maximum laser intensity to 80%. And in this case, because I am using that green 3D printed holder for the circular piece of glass, I have input an offset. Using the corner squaring tool that I showed you earlier, I've lined up the laser with the bottom left-hand corner of this green piece. I've clicked the framing button to make sure that my offset and everything is okay before I've started lasering this job. There are a lot of different methods out there for marking clear glass with a blue diode laser. You'll find a ton of them on YouTube. I went with this spray paint one because I haven't seen too many people demonstrate it on the Creality Falcon 2. Since the spray painted side of the glass was facing down, I set my laser focus to focus on that bottom face of the glass where the spray paint is. The black spray paint absorbs the energy from the laser and then marks the glass. I actually prefer the way the result looks with the paint still on the glass, but if you take some paint thinner, you can clean off all of that paint rather quickly and you're left with this frosted look. Now I think my settings might have been slightly too aggressive and some of that paint looks like it almost got absorbed into the frosted section of the glass and I had a hard time cleaning it out and those little spots just wouldn't go away. You do have to look really close to see them, so from a distance this really wouldn't be a problem, but I just want to point out that they are there. Prior to processing this piece, I did run the same graphic on another piece of glass at 7500 millimeters per minute and still with 80% power. And I didn't really like that result, so I think something in the middle would be best. So I would recommend 7000 millimeters per minute at 80% power for clear glass with black spray paint on the bottom side. One final thing to keep in mind when doing glass is that if you want people to view the frosted side as the front side of your piece, you'll have to mirror your graphic when lasering through the glass. In my case, I didn't do that because I have a preference for looking at the graphic through the glossy side of the glass. If you're anything like me, you've got a lot of projects on the go and it's pretty easy to lose track of some of your tools and accessories for your machines. The Creality Falcon comes with a lot of tools and accessories, plus this long air assist hose, and it's not long before your workspace gets pretty messy. To address this, I've designed this organizer caddy that attaches to the side of your Creality Falcon. If you flip the machine upside down, you'll find two M6 threaded holes that are not being used as they were alternative positions for the riser feet. We can attach our caddy using those two holes, or if you're using your foot in the backmost position, you can slide the caddy forward and use the next two holes. Either way, it's just two M6 screws that attach the caddy to the bottom of the machine. Then we can take the excess length of our air assist hose and gently wrap it around this spool here. The organizer comes with a few of these tube separators, which you can simply just press the air assist tubing inside of, and that's going to keep the tube from wanting to unravel. Finally, you can take the free end of your tube and attach it to your air assist pump. Then you can take the rest of your accessories like the extension feet, the toolbox, SD card, and perhaps even some extra tools that you might be commonly using like screwdrivers and put them in the organizer caddy. The original focusing tool slips onto the side or if you're using my corner squaring tool, it has the exact same feature and will slide onto the side so you don't lose it. Now we can have a look at the rotary attachment that came with this kit. Its purpose is to engrave round objects, so I picked myself up one of these tall and skinny tumblers. However, this tumbler does have a slight taper to it. And when we take a look at our rotary attachment, you'll see that the rollers are two parallel rollers. Putting the tumbler directly on top of these rollers presents us with two problems. The first problem is that when you turn the rollers, you'll notice that the tumbler starts to walk back and forth. And the second problem is that the top surface of the tumbler that we would be engraving is not parallel to the gantry. So we need to tilt that up. The rotary attachment comes with this roller accessory, which sort of acts like a steady rest. And if you take a close look at your rotary attachment, you'll see a series of holes on the left-hand side. 
Each series of those small holes will allow us to position the steady rest directly in the center of the parallel rollers according to the position of the front roller which you can move, and I'll show you that in a second. Right now my front roller is in the outward most position, so I'm going to use the included hardware to attach my steady rest to the holes in the outward most position. Looking at this from the bottom, you can see the steady rest has a slotted hole, so you can make some adjustments to move the steady rest inwards and outwards a bit. On the back of the steady rest, there are some thumb screws that you can loosen to move the rollers up and down. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't position the rollers low enough to get my tumbler parallel with my X gantry. I'm going to try and move the rollers closer together to move the right hand side of the water bottle up. I first loosened the rotary attachment belt by loosening off the thumb screw on the front of the attachment and then removed the two thumb screws on the front roller and I could move it closer to the rear roller. But this still wasn't enough to get my tumbler parallel with my gantry. So then I decided to decouple the steady rest from my rotary attachment by 3D printing this little base here. If you don't have a 3D printer, you could just easily make the same thing with a piece of wood. I'm going to screw the steady rest to this piece here and the purpose of it is just to be able to have this steady rest stand alone without tipping over. It retains its ability to adjust upwards and downwards using those thumb screws on the back and now I can move the steady rest out further and if I need to I can lift the rotary attachment to get the top surface of the tumbler parallel with my gantry. A good way to check is to take a small bubble level put it on top of your tumbler Check the angle and hopefully you're working on top of a level surface, this will make things a little easier. Then take that same bubble level, put it on top of your gantry, and if it's equally as level, then the two should be parallel. There's a couple more things to do before we can start lasering again, and we need to raise the entire frame. To do that, we'll use the included extension legs. We can unscrew one of the feet from the bottom of the frame, thread it into the extension legs, and now take that entire assembly and just thread it back into the bottom of the frame. Do this at all four corners of your machine. Now we can take our rotary attachment and we need to plug in the wiring harness. On the back of the attachment, you'll find a connector and one side of your harness will plug directly into that connector. It's keyed, so don't worry, you can't plug it in backwards. The other end of the harness goes to this plug located on the Y axis stepper motor on the inside of the front frame member. With the machine powered off, get in there with your fingers and unplug that connector and then just plug it into the harness. And again, this harness is also keyed so you can't plug that connector in backwards. Do not plug and unplug those connectors with the machine power on. Now we need to square up our rotary attachment with the gantry. I have this pretty simple method with a carpenter square whereby I butt the rotary attachment up against the bottom of the square and then the square reaches up to the gantry and it should touch the gantry. I do this on both ends of the rotary attachment and I might double check a few times just to make sure that I got it down perfect. And you guys can actually see the gap here in this shot between the rotary attachment and the gantry. Everything looks parallel. Next, we need to set the laser focus. So I've got my tumbler back on top of the rotary attachment. I have my focusing gauge here. I'm gonna set the height for engraving I'm going to make sure that my little gauge there is touching the highest point of my tumbler. And now I'm going to rotate my roller again by hand, but unfortunately I'm finding that this tumbler is still kind of walking back and forth. This will distort the graphic that I want to put on the tumbler. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this metal bar that I had sitting around and I'm going to butt it up against the one end of the tumbler because it wanted to walk to the right. And before we can start lasering, you see there that I was just pointing out some of my fingerprints on this thing. I'm gonna clean that with some isopropyl alcohol. And now I'm gonna blink the laser and try and line it up with the center axis of this tumbler. You'll see that I made some marks there and it's looking good. Next, I'm gonna import my graphic into laser GRVL. And again, I'm gonna vectorize this here because it worked well on the aluminum wallets. So I think on the stainless steel tumbler, Having that outline is going to keep things looking sharp. For a black powder coated tumbler, I've set the speed to 3000 millimeters per minute for both the border and filling at 80% maximum intensity. And the last thing we need to do before we can start is we need to change the steps per millimeter for the Y axis. For the regular XY Cartesian setup, it's set to 80 steps per millimeter. We need to change this for the rotary system. So we're going to type in $101 equals 60.375. 
that's going to change the y axis steps per millimeter to 60.375 steps per millimeter. I designed my graphic to the full length of the tumbler, and you also noticed in the previous clip there that it was rotated 90 degrees to match the orientation of this tumbler. And so my laser module starting position is on the left edge of the tumbler, right along the center axis. I've hit the frame button and you can see it being framed right now, right in the middle of the tumbler, just where I want it. Then we can hit start and the whole process begins. When using a rotary attachment with parallel rollers, make sure you don't set your speeds too high because I find that with these things, there's not really much holding the tumbler or water bottle or whatever it is that you're processing in place other than gravity. I mean, really it's just the friction between the surface of the tumbler or round object and those rollers that's holding it in place. And so if those rollers start spinning rather quickly, you might find that your object is going to slip and then you'll get a distorted image. Now you'll see here, what I ended up with was an extra outline around my image that didn't line up with the filled areas. But this wasn't because of my workpiece slipping. I got this buffer stuck message a few times during the job and it would pause the job and I would hit resume, but this seemed to throw the whole process out of sync. It seemed like certain lines of the G-code got skipped and this is what I ended up with. Not so great. Interestingly, this only happened when I was using the rotary attachment I'm not sure if this is a problem with my laptop or it was an issue with the engraver's controller, so I'm not really sure where to place the blame just yet. Regardless, once you're done with your rotary attachment, use $101 equals 80 to put the y-axis steps per millimeter back. Stay tuned for a future video where I've got a really big upgrade for the rotary system on the Falcon 2. Earlier in the video, I mentioned that Creality sent me an enclosure. <laughs> I'd plan on showing it in this video, but this video is getting pretty long, and I think it's best that we save it for a separate video. I'm already working on it, and it's pretty interesting, so be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss it. Overall, my experience with this machine has been very positive. However, there is some room for improvement, and my first and biggest issue is with the rotary attachment that we just looked at. Now, the parallel roller system is going to be a little bit limiting in what you can process. Things like mugs with handles, long objects, or even some tapered objects are going to be difficult to process. And the setup time just generally uh, was pretty long and tedious to get going with the rotary system. So I think there can be some improvements there. And I mentioned earlier that I have a future video coming up where I hope to address some of these issues. So stay tuned for that. Second, it'd be really nice if the laser module had a laser crosshairs to show you where your laser is centered. This is gonna help you get started with your jobs a lot quicker and of course, increase the accuracy of where you're gonna position your graphic on your workpiece. Third, it'd be great if they had their own software and that's more so for the beginner users. More advanced users will likely migrate to Lightburn anyways for the more advanced functions, but for beginners hopping into laser GRBL and having to enter in commands to control the power of the air assist or even to change from the XY system to the rotary system is not very user friendly. It'd be great if they had their own software. We could just click a button to switch from XY to rotary or even some sort of slider to adjust the power of the air assist. All that being said, I think it's competitively priced for the features that you get and you do get some very interesting features. The 22 watt laser module is a generous amount of power and it's sort of a smart laser module where you get the fire detection, integrated air assist, and it can even detect whether or not your air assist is properly flowing or if you have a blockage in your hose, and it has the ability to detect a dirty lens. I thought that was pretty interesting. I also really liked the job that they did on the wire management. That's something that I've seen a bunch of other brands struggle with, and if you guys are familiar with the Creality 3D printers, it was a very welcome surprise to see that they did such a great job on the wire and hose management on the system because sometimes on their 3D printers, that's not really their strong point. Another thing I really liked was that the machine came mostly pre-assembled. This is gonna cut down on the potential number of mistakes that you could make, especially as a beginner, when constructing your new piece of equipment. There's really nothing more frustrating than getting started with something and making a mistake and having your first experience a total nightmare. Also, the quality of the parts looks great, at least on par with other brands in this price range, and it was nice to see that they moved away from the generic aluminum extrusions of their older models to this very nice looking and very rigid frame. So that's it. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. And a big thank you to you guys for watching right to the end. And thank you again to Creality for sending me the Falcon 2. And if you guys are looking to support me in my work, check out my website, embracemaking.com. 
and I'll see you guys in another video.